Hello and welcome to the first episode of season four of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Whitecross, coming to you live from Johannesburg. We have over 120 episodes recorded and available on YouTube. So if you miss out because of load shedding or your Tuesday nights have gotten busy with in-person events, never fear, you can always catch up later. Tonight, we kick off with our traditional first episode theme, highlighting the bird of the year for 2023 the wonderful Cape Parrot. Please remember that you can use the Zoom chat and the Q&A feeds on Facebook and the Facebook comment feed to communicate with our panelists this evening. And we'll be sure to answer those questions during the discussion at the end of tonight's webinar. We've also got some amazing Bird of the Year merchandise on sale in the shop for the birds, including these wonderful and adorable fluffies. So be sure to get yours. All you have to do is hop on over to Bird Life South Africa's shop and you can order yours. Stocks are limited, so don't miss out. We are on all major social media channels, and you can use the hashtag Conservation Conversations to let us know what you think of tonight's show. We aim to keep these webinars free for all to learn and enjoy, but we do incur costs while running the show. So if you enjoy the series and you are able to contribute, no matter how small, please visit that Quicket page or EFT BirdLife South Africa directly using the reference webinars with your name. And a big thank you to all of you who have continued to help support the show. Now, have you booked your spot for Flock to the Wilderness in 2023? This promises to be an incredible event full of exciting birding excursions, top speakers, a showcase in quality ornithological research, and a gathering of passionate bird enthusiasts. The event will take place at the Wilderness Hotel from 24 to 28 May, and bookings are now open via BirdLife South Africa's website. Spots are limited, so be sure to book yours sooner rather than later. And BirdLife South Africa's AGM will be taking place on the Saturday with a luncheon after the meeting. So visit our website and find out more. We've also got the biennial Learn About Birds conference hosted with the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology, and this will be taking place during Flux to the Wilderness. So if you'd like the opportunity to showcase your research during the science lab, remember to submit your abstract via the lab page on BirdLife South Africa's website before 31 January. We've also hosted some fantastic virtual book launches with Jakarta Media over the past few years, and we're looking forward to another fascinating discussion with Dr. Bruce McKenzie on his new book, An Ecological Guide to the Bush. This book contains all you could ever wish to know about Savannah Ecology, so do register for Thursday night's webinar at seven o'clock you can find the registration link in the chat feed after tonight's intro. But finally, on to tonight's main event, and what a way to begin the year. BirdLife South Africa is lucky to have two dedicated species guardians supporting South Africa's endemic Cape Parrot. Joining us tonight, representing the Cape Parrot Project, is Dr. Frances Brooke, who joined the Cape Parrot Project in May 2022 after completing her MSc and PhD on Cape vultures. Her current role as a research manager at the Cape Parrot Project guides on the ground research, ensuring key knowledge gaps can be filled to inform the necessary conservation actions for the species protection. She has a love of the outdoors and is naturally keen and interested in birds. Representing the Cape Parrot Working Group is Professor Colleen Downs, who has been at the University of Kwazulu Natal since the mid 1994 and is now a professor in the School of Life Sciences at UKZN Peter Maritzburg campus. She holds an NRF Sarchi Research Chair in Ecosystem Health and Biodiversity in KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape. Colleen is a terrestrial vertebrate biologist with broad and interdisciplinary research interests. These include conservation, ecology, physiology, and behavior of terrestrial vertebrates in unpredictable environments and with changing land use. She has been involved in Cape Parrot research since 1992. She was BirdLife South Africa's honorary president between 2016 and 2020, and she is an honorary fellow of the International Ornithological Union and the American Ornithological Union. Her hobbies include bird watching and bird banding. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am very, very excited to see this evening's webinar. We have pre-recorded it just to avoid any techno gremlins but we will be joining Cole and Francis for a live discussion at the end of tonight's recording. There we go. 
Good evening and hello. Good evening, everyone. So good to have you guys with us. And uh, if there's anybody you'd like to say hello to while we're just wrapping up the last few minutes, now is your chance. I saw one of our stalwarts, Malcolm Gimmels, joined from Crichton. So wonderful. Absolutely. A big hello to you, Malcolm, and thanks for all that you do, not just for the Cape Parrot, but the beautiful blue swallows as well. A real myth belt conservationist. Thank you for joining us, Malcolm. Francis, anybody you'd like to say good evening to? Yeah, good evening. Um, just uh, thank you to BirdLife for hosting these wonderful um, initiatives like, like these webinars. Um, and thank you for letting us sort of lead the pack, so to speak, um, and letting us share the, the awesome work and the awesome bird of the year. Um, and we are very excited to share all the work that is, that is being done. Um, and yeah, hopefully it's an interesting talk for everyone. Absolutely. I have no doubt that it will be. And a big thank you to the two of you for your incredible efforts in pulling tonight's show together. So without further ado, I am going to bring up the recording and we'll enjoy what they have to share with us. Thank you, everyone. South Africa, the home of approximately 725 resident bird species, but only one endemic parrot, the Cape Parrot. The Cape Parrot, Posipolis robustus, translates from Greek posipolis, meaning different head, referring to the difference in coloration between the head and the body. Robustus, referring to the species' relatively large and strong bull. The Cape Parrot is approximately 30 centimetres in size, only 3 centimetres short compared to an African grey, and the Cape Parrot weighs in at between 250 and 350 grams. The Cape Parrot has rather cryptic coloration when against their natural habitat of Afro-temperate misspelled forests, or simply misspelled forests. Their head is an olive green coloration, and as their genus name suggests, differs from their green bodies and dark green wings. The species is sexually dimorphic, meaning that males and females can be differentiated based on their plumage. Both adult sexes display red coloration on their shoulders and ankles. Females can often be identified by the orange crown on their forehead, which is often absent in adult males. Juveniles and adults can also be differentiated, as juveniles often lack the red coloration on their wings and ankles, however, display a similar orange patch to that of the female. These beautiful birds, of which approximately 1,800 individuals remain in the wild, can be found distributed across three provinces in the naturally fragmented habitat of the misspelled forests. The population is thus divided into three genetically distinct subpopulations. The Amatola region in the Eastern Cape constitutes the southern population, whilst the central population extends from Ngobo and Mtata in the Eastern Cape through to the Midlands in KwaZulu-Natal. The last northern disjunct population is located in the Mahubas Kloof of the Limpopo province. As a naturally fragmented habitat, southern misspelled forest patches occur in a landscape mosaic. These high altitude southern misspelled forests, dominated by tall canopies of Otaniqua yellowwood, real yellowwood, wild plums and white stinkwoods, are located between 700 and 1,300 meters above a sea level occurring on steep south and southeast facing slopes and in fire resistant valleys, where an average of 1000 millimeters of rainfall is recorded annually, often in the summer months. Misspelled forests are a threatened habitat and cover less than 1% of the country's land cover, yet is among South Africa's most diverse ecosystems. Not only are these forests home to Cape parrots, but they're also home to some mango monkeys and the near threatened crowned eagle, Concerningly, however, less than 10% of South Africa's misspelled forests are formally protected, putting a number of species at risk of habitat loss. Whilst misspelled forests are so important, they are difficult to protect. Given the charismatic nature of Cape parrots and their dependence on misspelled forests, they act as the flagship species for the protection of many forest fauna and flora. In addition, these forests are also important for, for providing water and carbon sequestration. Therefore, 
the conservation and persistence of Cape parrots help protect forest habitats, and the conservation and persistence of forest habitats help protect Cape parrots. Cape parrots rely on these misspelled forests as a feeding source, consuming an array of indigenous fruits and kernels, and these forests are vital for providing important nesting sites. Cape parrots nest in existing tree hollows in mature forest hardwood species. They are therefore considered secondary cavity nesters, meaning that they rely on cavities formed by primary cavity nesters, such as woodpeckers, or by other means such as broken branches or the rotting back of the tree core. Cape parrots appear to have a preference for nesting in Otaniqua and real yellow woods across their distribution. Nest sites can be found in yellow woods that are in various stages of decay, in snags, which are standing dead trees, or in trees that are intact. Breeding season starts in late winter, early spring, when established pairs will start prospecting for nests. Some pairs will undertake so-called renovations to the nest and will conduct nest maintenance activities such as chewing the nest cavity entrance. Pairs may also be seen excavating the cavity using the wood chip lining created by this excavating to line the nest floor. Both males and females partake in this activity and often take turns. One individual will carry out the excavating activities whilst the second individual sits perched on a branch close to the nest entrance and they will frequently swap roles. Once the pair is satisfied with their home improvements and copulation has occurred, the female spends considerable time in the nest incubating alone. She will in the mornings, however, join the male for a quick excursion, but return shortly to the nest, spending minimum time at the cavity entrance. While she remains in the cavity for long periods, the male will often remain outside the cavity. Nest sites are often located between 12 and 20 meters above the ground. These nest cavities need to be deep enough to avoid nest predation by species such as the Samango monkey and the African harrier hawk. Cape parrots lay between one and five eggs, and after about a 30-day incubation period by the female, the eggs hatch asynchronously. The nestling period lasts approximately 63 days, and chicks may fledge at different times. For a few weeks post-fledgling, chicks remain dependent on their parents for food, after which time they join large juvenile flocks, which gather, roost, and often travel together to various feeding sites. Cape parrots are known as food nomads, meaning that they move between forest patches when they are foraging. Cape parrots are often considered predispersal seed predators. They consume the kernels of yellowwood fruit, but are also eat the fruits and seeds of an array of indigenous plant species. More than 30 indigenous tree species make up their diet and include species such as the Otaniqua yellowwood, but also includes species such as the wild plum, white stinkwood, and assegai. Most of the kernels eaten provide high protein, fat, and energy content. When feeding on small fruits like ironwood or white stinkwood, they peel the exocarp off and eat the kernel, a bit like you and I eating ground nuts, often eating another every 10 seconds or so. Interestingly, they have also been observed feeding on protea flower heads in grasslands near forests at certain times of the year. They also occasionally feed on the flower heads of other species. Cape parrots also show a preference for exotic species as alternative food sources in areas away from forests. These species include the black wattle, Mexican bird cherry, syringa and pecan nuts at certain times of the year. Pecan nuts appear to be a favorite exotic, consuming these even if there is a relatively high availability of indigenous forest fruit. The regular fruiting patterns, the relatively high density in the landscape, and high fat and protein content of pecan nuts 
make it an attractive food source. They may then concentrate at non-forest food sources, especially commercially grown pecan nut orchards. However, the high fat in the pecans can be likened to fast foods for humans, rather delicious, but not necessarily nutritious. Parrots often partake in geophagy, which is the consumption of clay or soil. This is a behavior not often recorded in Cape parrots. There are several reasons for geophagy, including neutralizing toxins and or providing essential minerals, particularly sodium or calcium. Cape parrots also need to drink often, which can be sourced from water trapped in leaves or in small hollows in trees that are filled with water, or as seen here, from water trickling down a rock face. Cape parrots can also source water from small puddles or streams, such as witnessed here at a pecan orchard. The cave parrot threatened status can be attributed to a number of pressures. The biggest contribution to the cave parrot decline is habitat loss and degradation. Historical logging practices targeted hardwood species such as yellowwoods, assegai and ironwood, with the wood being used for everything from fence posts to furniture. This has led to forest fragmentation and the reduction of forest areas. Current logging practices, notably in the Amatola region, still allow for hardwoods, such as yellowwoods, to be harvested. Crownless trees, trees that have lost more than 70% of their crown, or windfallen trees fall within the harvesting criteria. At a subsistence level, harvesting of sub-canopy trees for poles, or the removal of bark for medicinal use, is also underway. This degradation and loss of forest habitat has a knock-on effect for Cape parrots. The removal of these mature trees means the removal of vital nesting sites. Many small forest patches are lost due to forest exploitation practices as previously mentioned, which is likely to impact food availability. Among forest patches, indigenous species exhibit variable fruiting seasons. Historically, this would mean that provided the Cape parrots kept moving, they would have food available year round. With the loss of these habitat patches, this has subsequently resulted in Cape parrots finding food sources outside of forest patches to feed on non-indigenous food resources and subsequently bringing them into contact with humans. With pecan nuts being a favorite food source, Cape parrots often flock to pecan orchards in large numbers. This can bring them into conflict with humans. Cape parrots have in the past been considered crop pests and were subsequently persecuted. The high number of Cape parrots at orchards allow for opportunists to attempt to catch parrots for the illegal pet trade. Handheld catapults, or kitties, are used to attempt to strike the bird and immobilize it. This can result in horrific injuries such as broken wings or injuries associated with blunt force trauma such as internal hemorrhaging often leading to death or humane euthanasia. If that is not enough, Cape parrots also face another threat, cystocene beak and feather disease, or PBFD. This disease is a highly infectious viral disease that is spread through the environment or through transmission from one individual to another. Contaminated water sources or nesting sites allow for infection, but also the ingestion or inhalation of the virus such as through feather dust, helps the disease spread. Disease spread can be from adult to offspring or through one individual to another who may not be related. Symptoms of the disease include abnormal feather growth, leading to feather loss and lesions on the bull. PBFD can also cause immunosuppression, which can lead to secondary infections. Whilst we are aware of those current threats, there are two emerging threats that also need mentioning. A small in stature, but possibly significant threat to misspelled habitat 
is that of the exotic polyphagous shot hole borer beetle, or PSHB. This beetle, which is native to Southeast Asia, is a mere two millimeters in length and was first discovered in South Africa in 2017. It has quickly spread throughout South Africa and is found in all the major cities. The beetle has a symbiotic relationship with a specific fungus. When the borer beetle infests a tree and creates a tunnel, the fungus carried by the beetle grows in the tunnels. The fungus then spreads throughout the sapwood, blocking the transportation of water and nutrients and ultimately causing the tree to die. Concerningly, 43% of trees affected by PSHB are Cape parrot feeding species and include real yellowwood and wild plum. Climate change also poses a threat to forests and subsequently Cape parrots. Conservation actions need to take a multifaceted approach to address this threat, taking into consideration the protection of currently large forest patches, maintaining or building connectivity between forests, and the restoration and reforestation efforts in suitable areas. In order to carry out the conservation of Cape parrots and their habitat, a number of stakeholders, including government, non-profit organizations, scientists, and the public, are working tirelessly to ensure the Cape parrot and misspelled forests persist in the landscape. In 2019, 48 stakeholders, representing 23 organizations, departments, and institutions, all gathered to develop a conservation action plan, building a roadmap to guide species and habitat conservation activities. This resulted in the Cape Parrot and Misspelled Forest Action Plan. By developing this action plan, it allows not only for organizations to work together, but to ensure that conservation efforts are coordinated for the protection and recovery of the Cape Parrot and misspelled forests. In an effort to conserve and allow for the persistence of forest habitats, reforestation and restoration actions are considered key conservation priorities. These actions can help to restore and increase the carbon potential of forests and aid in reversing the impact of logging. The process of clearing alien invasive plants and planting indigenous trees can facilitate the recovery of degraded areas. In the Amatola region, the Cape Parrot project started planting trees in 2011, with a primary focus of sites being selected for the benefit of Cape Parrots. Trees, established from seedlings collected in the forest and successfully grown, were purchased from community micro-nurseries for reforestation and restoration efforts. This model has grown successfully in and around Hogsback, with the Cape Parrot project helping to establish micro-nurseries in four communities surrounding the forest. These community nursery members are trained in various skills, ranging from seed identification and collection methods to composting and growing. The Cape Prairie Project is also working closely with organisations and, co and corporates such as Green Pop, Fair Tree and the Brownie Points Initiative, resulting in local community members being provided with employment opportunities. With the addition of these members, this has allowed for additional efforts for restoration and reforestation with alien vegetation management being a key activity and the planting of 5,000 trees in two months also contributing significantly. As our previous president, Mr. Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which can be used to change the world. Conservation education should aim to positively influence people's beliefs and behaviors towards wildlife and their habitats. To achieve this, the Cape Parrot Project has partnered with a number of organizations to establish and increase awareness of the Cape Parrot. The Cape Parrot Project has implemented educational programs through partnerships with the Wildlife and Environment Society of South Africa, or WESA, within the Eastern Cape, and Hobbiton Outdoor Education Center, based in Hogsback. Education camps host underprivileged children from local communities, providing the opportunity for them to experience the forests and learn about biodiversity in the Cape Parrot. These programs ultimately aim to educate the youth in the area about the importance of parrots, the habitat they occupy, and the importance of understanding the values of natural ecosystems. Bags for Good, in partnership with Woolworths and BirdLife South Africa's Important Bird and Biodiversity Areas program, created these very stylish bags. 
For every bag that is purchased, 10 Rand is donated to BirdLife South Africa to assist with stewardship, particularly aimed to secure certain forest patches as protected areas in the Misbelt Forest IBA. The first version of the Cape Parrot bag came out in 2017, with a second version being released in 2022. Being quite popular, there may not be many left, so be sure to look out for them in Woolworth stores. A very exciting long-term initiative that I'm sure many of you may be aware of is the annual Cape Parrot Big Birding Day. Started in 1998, this initiative has run for the past 24 years as part of the conservation effort of the Cape Parrot Working Group. The information gathered during this day is used to obtain annual population estimates, as well as help in gathering data on nests and threats such as disease prevalence in the population or reporting incidents of tree felling in forests where observers are located. If you are lucky enough to live in an area within close proximity to Cape Parrots, or would like to visit an area where one can spot Cape Parrots, the Cape Parrot Big Birding Day is certainly a fine opportunity. This initiative is held every year in May and needs parrot spotters to, to help count them. Many stalwart observers take part, but any new active birders or local communities are also needed to assist. So please get in touch with the Cape Parrot Working Group or your local bird club to volunteer. Another project you as a citizen scientist can get involved in is through the recording of Cape Parrot sightings through the Bird Lesser app. This free mobile app helps us as researchers to gain more valuable data to understand the space use and conservation needs of the species. By logging your sightings, you can also help improve the SABAP2 distribution map for the Cape Parrot. So please be sure to sign up and register for the Cape Parrot Project course on the Bird Lasser app. As the Cape Parrot is often considered the jewel of the forest, it is important that we all work towards conserving this incredibly special bird. Should you be interested in finding out more about the Cape Parrot and its habitat and the work that is being done by various stakeholders to protect the species, be sure to check out the following web pages. Or alternatively, you can reach out to me at francis at wildbirdtrust.com or Professor Colleen Downs at downs at ukzn.ac.za should you have any questions or queries. A special thank you to the individuals who provide and continue to take wonderful photos of Cape Parrots. All the work being done to protect and conserve the Cape Parrot and its habitat would not be possible without the support of a number of organisations. We therefore thank you for continuing the support in protecting this incredible jewel of the forest. And thank you to you as citizen scientists for continuing to support and contribute to the conservation of the Cape Parrot through efforts such as the Cape Parrot Big Birding Day and the submission of your sightings through the Bird Lesser app. Please keep them coming. Thank you so much for that fantastic showcase of our absolutely incredible Bird of the Year, Francis Cole. That was wonderful and such incredible visuals with those beautiful videos. So thank you so much for, for putting that together. While we wait for Francis to get back on with us, um, Cole, would you like to uh, add anything to that presentation um, before we, we move into some of the questions? Um, <laughs> yeah, I just think so many people don't realize that South Africa's got an endemic parrot, something in their own backyard. And these forests where they're found are so important as well. Um, so really just to encourage people to come and help bird and report 
any observations, take photos. We're always grateful for any information. So thank you. Absolutely. And yeah, thanks for that call. Certainly uh, an incredible thing to have a bird that occurs nowhere else in the world except here in South Africa. When we say endemic, that's really what we're saying. So this is 100% our incredible species to protect. Francis, from your side, anything you'd like to, to add to that? Um, yeah, just, you know, it would be great if, um, yeah, if, uh, you know, citizen science can definitely contribute and we need all the help we can get. Um, so, you know, it's always a great adventure to come here and based here in Hogsback. So if you want to come check some parrots, come here and um, see how beautiful they are and, you know, really get that passion for, 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 for the species. <laughs> Absolutely, a passion which I can see you both share. Um, Cole, would you like to just elaborate a little bit for anyone who is maybe tantalized to join the army of uh, parrot observers on Parrot Big Birding Day, what, what do you need people to do? What does a, a big parrot day look like? Um, unfortunately for many people, they like to just go and twitch the bird and then not help in subsequent years. <laughs> and really what we need is people to help you in the new art and so often it's the local, <clears throat> excuse me, community that really are, help a lot. And I see some of the organizers, organizers from the different areas within the distribution range are with us tonight. And they really assist in helping get you out to a particular forest. And then we've split for many, or well, since the beginning when we started, we split it over an afternoon and the following morning because Cape parrots are active either late afternoon or very early morning. And if you're not there by dawn, you won't see them. Um, but often on one of the days, it rains. And so um, that's partly also why we've split it. This year, we might also have days before the May Day in some of the areas where they're seen flying out to Pekins earlier in the year, because that is one of the main ways that people do get to see them, is when they're flying out from the forest, and they're usually call in flight. So it makes it easier to distinguish them from other species. Brilliant, absolutely. And uh, yeah, as Paul said, we need people who are, are not there just to twitch, but uh, will enjoy a day observing the forest. And it won't just be Cape parrots that you see flying around there. So I'm sure lots of other incredible birds like the crowned eagle and various others to enjoy if you do put in the effort. But um, and, yeah, Sorry, yeah. if I can just add, especially our forests in the former trans sky, um, if you look at Sabah, People just haven't got out there early enough, I think, in the morning to record the birds. So please, if you are in those areas and you can help on Parrot Day, it would be wonderful. Definitely. Yeah, I think a, a challenge we can put out towards the, the George Sarsfeld campus, maybe on our way, working towards Flock to Wilderness, see if we can get some observers out into those Eastern Cape areas. But um, Francis, you did a, a fantastic job putting that recording together. And thanks so much to, to you and Cole for all the input on that wonderful talk. I know you mentioned the, the Cape Parrot Action Plan. Do you want to just elaborate a little bit on that and what that document's all about and, and maybe tell people about the website if they're interested in hearing more? Sure. So as I mentioned, it was started, um, well, stakeholders realized, you know, that there needs to be a roadmap for, for this um, species. So it covers a whole range of um, pillars. It's got four pillars basically, which concerns research um, and habitat, um, communities, and also law enforcement. And obviously these all need to work together to ensure that we, um, you know, all our objectives are aligned and um, that our work is, is very coordinated. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, there's a, a wonderful document that's been written um, that highlights all the activities that need to be carried out. So it's definitely worthwhile having a look and getting in touch with anybody uh, or any of the stakeholders to see if you, if anybody could assist in any of the matters. That would be wonderful. 
Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing that. And uh, it is quite an interesting format you guys chose for this uh, presentation. Cole, would you like to uh, allude people as to what that format was all about? Yeah, it's part of the education bit. Um, we've tried to link the poster that will be coming out quite soon, the headings that we've used on that in the presentation this evening, so that if people need some kind of use of it in schools, perhaps, and yeah, just so then students can see the posters with the headings and perhaps they'll learn more from actually seeing the visuals now if this is available on YouTube. Absolutely, and I think we might need to uh, put a QR code link to this YouTube episode on that poster so that people can scan in and uh, access this fantastic visual show piece to go along with it. And for those of you who don't know, BirdLife South Africa does a fantastic initiative with its Bird of the Year every year, thanks to very generous support from Hans Hohaus and Charitable Trust. And working together with our species guardians or the relevant uh, supporters a whole lot of education materials are put together. That includes infographics, the fantastic posters that have become synonymous with BirdLife South Africa's Bird of the Year. We get the fluffies made, I'll put them on screen once more, make sure you get yours, they are super cute. And uh, pin badges and various other amazing initiatives linked to our Bird of the Year campaign, all about raising awareness. So be sure to hop on over to that Bird of the Year link on the BirdLife South Africa website, and you can get free access to all of the Bird of the Year material going back right up to, I think, about 2013. So loads of amazing birds, victory bird, white wing flufftail, blue cranes, lots of interesting information. If you are into education or you know someone who's looking for material, it is free, it is there, we've got lesson plans, really, really worth engaging with that material. If you're someone who just looks after youngsters and need a fun activity to do with them, there's a whole lot of awesome activities to get them engaged and learning about birds. So do make use of that free resource and uh, be sure to, to download all of the incredible activities off of BirdLife South Africa's website. Ladies, I'm not seeing any uh, other questions coming through. So I'd like to give each of you a, a last chance just to highlight anything you'd like to raise before we, we start to close off. And, uh, oh, sorry, we do have one question before I allow you that chance. Thanks, Eleanor Mary, apologies, that snuck in. But um, Eleanor has written, I may have missed it watching the fascinating videos, but what sort of total population do we have left of this beautiful bird? And because they seem to flock for food sources, do they also nest fairly close together or are they fairly spread out? So Cole, if you can tackle the population size and Francis, if you wouldn't mind speaking to the nesting, please. Yes, yeah, so we've been doing these annual bird counts um, for close on 25 years now. And the parrots are quite difficult to actually get a population estimate in because you can go to a forest one day and they're there and the next day they're gone. So by having observers at the different forests, we try and work out how many there are um, as they move between and within forests. One of the problems is, is that some years is rain. In some areas, we don't get coverage. And then, especially a forest where people year in and year out don't see any parrots, they don't really want to go back there. <laughs> but that data is just as important. And so some years, our numbers are a bit lower, often because of the weather, and perhaps sometimes if we don't have enough people. But yeah, we estimate there are about 1,800 in the wild. Um, and what gives us hope are the juvenile flocks that we see, especially in the parrot day. And sometimes people see the birds mating, they see them at nest sites. Um, so it isn't all doom and gloom. And especially in the drought years, they seem to show evidence of the disease more, the beacon feather. And we thought that would really cause the population to crash, but somehow the parrots have kept going. Um, so yeah, we just encourage everyone to keep helping count because without counting them, we don't know what population trends are happening. Absolutely. 
Francis, your turn. <laughs> sure. So um, in terms of them nesting quite close together, we have found, particularly here in Hogsback, that they seem to um, sort of nest in relatively loose colonies. And then in the mornings, they will all um, come together, at, um, flock at gathering sites, and you'll see huge flocks of, of Cape parrots. It's a beautiful thing to see, I have to be very honest. Um, yes, yeah, so they'll flock together, um, have a little chatter, see what's, you know, kind of like the morning news, what everybody's up to, make a huge noise, and then they'll decide whichever direction they would like to fly, and the whole group will fly off in whatever direction they've decided. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, relatively loose colonies um, is how they uh, kind of nest together. Fantastic. Thanks, Francis. And it seems so like... It's, Oh, sorry, Cole, so it's, it's very affected by how many nest sites are, are close by. So if there aren't many nest sites, then yeah, they can't be in those loose colonies. So yeah. Absolutely. One of the other questions was about the green parrots um, in the Irene area. And I often get phone calls from people saying they're Cape parrots in Durban. Um, sadly, Historically, the parrots from the Midlands forest used to fly to the coast, but most of you know that our coastal forests have really been decimated and they used to go and feed there, especially in the summer months. And the green parrots, noisy ones flying around, are the invasive exotic parrots. Um, and just to really yeah, people don't want to get rid of them because they're pretty parrots, but the impact that they can have, especially on our nesting birds, like barbets, etc., is quite scary. And they carry diseases that affect some of our indigenous birds. So it is a big concern, are these invasive rose-necked parakeets, as some people call them. Thanks for that, Carl. Absolutely. Uh, we certainly saw mention of the shot hole borer, another horrible invasive species having huge impacts on uh, our native tree species and some of the planted tree species. But yeah, these invasive species bring a lot of challenges. I see our audience have woken up and found their keyboards, ladies, so I'm not going to let you go just yet. <laughs> but um, we've got a few great questions coming through here and we're going we're gonna to stick with the breeding aspect. So Michael Potts has asked whether we've got any information on the general breeding success rates of these parrots. So Francis, I know the Cape Parrot Project's been doing some long-term nest monitoring. Would you like to speak to that? And then we'll get the KZN aspects from Cole after that. Sure. So yes, we've actually, the Cape Parrot Project has indeed looked at that. Um, and they monitored about, I think it was 24 nests, I stand corrected. Um, and they found that there was about a breeding success rate of 58%. Um, so relatively in the middle of kind of average. Um, but yeah, so um, of the 26, sorry, it was 26 um, breeding attempts, only um, 15 of those nests actually produced fledglings and um, at least only one fledgling at, at a minimum of, was successful. Thanks. And Cole on the KZN side? Yeah, sadly, the parrots can only breed when they're about four to five years old. And then if they do find a nest site, it's often in a dead tree or snag, as we call it. And those often, over time, especially with wind or snow and that, degrade further. And so the actual nest site um, sometimes collapses. And so we've had that happen where all the chicks have been killed. Um, so there's a lot of individual variation in with how successful nest is. Certainly. And uh, I see there's quite a bit of interest in the nest box uh, program. I'm not sure, Francis, if you can share some of the experiences gained through the Cape Parrot Project's nest box initiative. Sure. So uh, the Cape Parrot Project has installed um, three prototypes. So we're on our third prototype at the moment. Um, the first one started off early on when the project um, was established between or started in 2009. Unfortunately, there was not much success with those. Um, so there was a little bit of a redesign 
and um, prototype two, um, not again, not much success. Um, now on prototype three, we've had um, a couple of um, Cape parrots inspecting them because um, we've managed to put camera traps up next to the uh, boxes so we can keep an eye on what's happening. Um, yeah, so we've had one or two parrots showing an interest. Um, and obviously, you know, nest boxes are something that would take time for the parrots to become accustomed to. And um, as was alluded to earlier, you know, they, they take time to, to find their nests and then really make it um, to their liking with their own home improvements, if you can say that. Um, so, you know, hopefully this new prototype, we will see them more interest with them. And also just taking into consideration where we place these nest boxes um, is also something that we're looking at and hoping to inform future um, decisions as to where we place them. Absolutely, and uh, certainly having to deal with the, the bee invasion as well is always an interesting <laughs> challenge. Uh, bees yes. also a species of conservation concern, but uh, <laughs> certainly not the, the best way to try and conserve these parrots when the hives come in. Cole, would you like to add mm -hmm. something to that? Yeah, so we've only had one successful use of a nest box in the car cliff and really the bees were one <laughs> um, overall. But just to also highlight in terms of the population, in certain areas of their distribution, the numbers have really declined. So around the car cliff, Dargal, Balgan area, the numbers compared to the 1950s are much lower. So um, when I said earlier on that the population has stayed fairly constant, well, that's what we think. Um, there are areas where numbers have declined. And a lot of that is perhaps from historical logging. And although that stopped by the 1950s, it takes really long time for the big yellow woods to grow and become canopy trees again and provide nest sites. So, we really encourage that there's no logging of these big trees in these forests because not only do they provide nest sites eventually to parrots, but they're useful for many other species. And the parrots love these snags for sunning and socializing in the early mornings. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. a really critical layer in that forest system. So very important to keep those around. And thanks for raising that call. Um, I see Gordon made a comment that he understood Cape parrots around the hogsback area were living and subsisting in exotic forests. And he says, is that wrong, Francis? I'm not sure if you can expand on that, please. Sure, thanks for the question, Gordon. Um, so most of our parrots uh, or nesting sites are located within the forests. There are, um, I think, three sites that we have discovered where they are on the periphery of the forests in um, pine trees. Um, but most of the, the exotics seem to be more of a food source rather than, than a, um, a nesting area. Fantastic. And speaking of food sources, I see we're getting lots of chatter around the, the sort of human wildlife conflict when it comes to parrots snacking down on, on pecan nuts. Um, Francis, you guys have been doing a lot of work around the, the pecan nut farming industry. Can you just chat a bit about um, and the sort of impacts that these birds are having and vice versa, the impact that farmers are having on the Cape parrots? Sure. So a lot of research needs to go into the actual impact that these long, this diet will have on, uh, pecan, pecans will have on their diet and what it is for consequences in terms of health. Um, in the past, as mentioned, you know, they, the parrots were persecuted um, as they were considered crop pests. And um, we've seen in the Amatolas, uh, pecan orchards are um, a vital, or, you know, it's a very a popular food source for the parrots. We've had um, recordings of over 500 parrots on a single day attending to the pecan orchard. So, you know, they, they really are a hotspot. Um, so with being a hotspot, you know, it is also a threat to the parrots with, you know, opportunists just um, seeing all these parrots and thinking, well, this is probably a, a nice spot for to capture parrots for the illegal pet trade. Um, so that's that is a concern, and I think that speaks to you know education around the around these hotspots. You know, really addressing the youth and um, trying to um, you know tell them the importance of these parrots within the ecosystem 
Um, and yeah, pretty much that. <laughs> Fantastic. And we know a lot of these uh, agricultural landscapes use pesticides to try and keep the, the insect load down on their fruits. Have you noticed any sort of impact from insecticide use and pesticide use on the parrots themselves? Um, and is anybody looking into these potential impacts? That is a very good question. As far as I'm aware, they are, um, we have not looked at that. Um, but it's definitely something that is worthwhile considering. So thank you for raising that point. Awesome. And that was from Letitia Steinberg. Thanks, Letitia. And uh, Cole, I know um, we've sort of spoken about captive birds. Inga's asking whether there are any captive breeding programs for Cape parrots. Yes. And um, that's one thing that when the Cape Working Group formed was that it had that focus um, and a stud book was developed, and there are a couple of really good um, agriculturists who've contributed a huge amount to our understanding of Cape parrots. And so in the short term, the parrots that are bred in captivity, we see them more for flooding the market. So there's no need to take any birds out of the wild um, because wild birds are very stressed and they don't breed and do well in captivity. Um, so the other importance of the stud book is when people try and bring birds into Europe and America, we get contacted to check whether the birds are actually um, were captive bred. And again, that helps in the whole conservation and regulating the trade. Thanks for that, Cole. And uh, I see um, we've got a question here from Sharon as well for our Cape Parrot Twitches. So um, Francis, if you wouldn't mind just explaining if someone would like to find a, a guide in the Hogsback area, how they can go about getting in touch with someone who can point them in the direction of their next tick. <laughs> sure. Um, I think the easiest would probably just to be re to reach out to us at the project and we can put you in contact or we can even show you um, and yeah, we can just show you the ropes and, you know, show you the hotspots <laughs> so you can tick it off. And so yeah, just get in contact with us is easiest. Awesome. And on the, your side, Cole? Well, the, the, some of the bird life guides, especially in the Mokhubas Kloof area mm -hmm. and in Crichton, um, there are some guides, but Malcolm Gimmel, who's with us this evening, is really an excellent person for showing you Cape parrots in the southern part of KZN. Absolutely. And those of you who are really into your subspecies and your potential future ticks, you're going to have to go to all three of those genetically on their way to being distinct populations to try and uh, get your armchair ticks in place. So go and go on to yeah. the South Africa website and get hold of David and Paul and the others up in Mokhubis Cliff. And as Paul said, out in the Crichton area, Malcolm Gimmel can certainly help you out. And we've got the Cape Parrot Project in Hogsback. Cole, did you want to add something there? We're already finding the vocalizations are slightly different between the different areas. So um, go and take that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It is a new challenge for all of you, audio ticking. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Cole, thank you for that and thanks Francis. Um, last uh, technical question, this is from Eddie asking if one of you could please recap the explanation of the Greek and Latin names of the bird. Um, so obviously you're referring to Poitiphilus robustus, if you wouldn't mind just uh, reiterating what that means. Sure, um, so Poitiphilus meaning um, different coloration from the body and the head, where the robustus refers to the strong bill um, of the parrot, and overall it's quite generally stocky appearance, so it's robust. <laughs> Fantastic, thanks for that Francis. Okay, last one, and I'd like each of you to please uh, offer this, and this is from Di Beaton, and she's asking, what would your golden thread for educational material being developed for grade fours to sixes be? when it comes to Cape Parrots. And while you think about it, I'm going to pull up our closing slides because we're almost there. <laughs> Who'd like to go first? 
<laughs> Stumped us. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I think they the, are such a, sorry, Colleen, carry on. <laughs> on the Parrot Day, we do have a lot of school groups join different observers. Um, so that would be the first, the, the best is for them actually to see the parrots in the wild. Um, then the second best is some of the zoos do have them, if they're in areas, um, to use some of this material. And then on our websites, both for um, the Action Plan, Cape Parrot Project, and the Cape Parrot Working Group, there's lots of information there. And then all of us are willing to come and give talks at schools. Um, but most of all, I think just a love of birds. Um, we Here in Natal, we do a lot of bird ringing with school groups to show them birds in the hand. It's not just parrots that we want our youngsters to learn about. It's all our different birds and the importance of looking after our environment, not just our forests and grasslands, but rivers as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Carl. Francis, would you like to add your thoughts? I think Colleen has hit the nail on the head there. Um, I don't think I can top that. <laughs> and uh, get them some of these. That'll also help. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last last plug for better the material. Ladies, this has been such a fun evening. Thank you so much for, for all your time and putting that together and for fielding the many, many questions. I certainly learned a lot tonight and I'm sure our audience have as well. And I could not agree with you more. The the ability to light that spark and love of nature and birds is a real privilege. And I would highly encourage all of you that are willing and able to engage youngsters to get interested in birds and exposed to birds to get out there and do it um, share that passion and light that spark. But uh, Cole, any last sentiments before we close off this evening? Yeah, just to thank everyone who's been involved with Cape Parrots, um, especially the last 30 years. Um, it hasn't been just an individual effort. It's been a group effort and many thanks to all. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Cole. Francis? Yeah, thank you so much to everyone for tuning in tonight. It was great to share our work. And hopefully, when you see your Cape Pirates, you can log them on our Citizen Science um, Bird Lasser apps um, so you can help us uh, help the parrots. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you both. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. The first episode of season four is done and dusted. And I think it was an excellent one to set the tone for another wonderful year. Just a reminder, we won't be back next week. We're moving to a bi-weekly cycle. So we will be back on the 7th of February with another exciting conservation conversation with BirdLife South Africa. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Keep your eyes on the skies, keep enjoying those birds, and we will see you in two weeks time. Good night, everybody, and keep safe. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.